Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 633, that's 633 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, I hope you are doing well, wherever this bloody podcast may find you, how am I? Pretty good, all things considered, pretty bloody good. I'm a little bit frustrated though, tiny bit. Because yesterday was the 22nd and that was the last, last, last day that my local leisure centre was open, aka my gym. So it was the only time I was able to get in a quick workout before it closes for an extended period, I think, up until the 6th, I think. I think it's the 6th it closes until, which is really crazy. Because, you know, basically no one's got an opportunity to go the first day of the new year. Like the whole, like, you know, January 1st, New Year's resolution vibes. You're going to have to hold on until either the 6th or the 3rd, not to show one or the other. But either way, I won't have any ability to go to a gym for all those weeks in between. Now, the good thing is, is it's meant to be a pure or easy gym. One of those branches opening very soon near to where I live. So that should be good in terms of having a place to go to for like an emergency. Imagine if I want to go after 9 p.m. when my gym usually closes. I could definitely go into one of those ones because they're usually open 24 hours in a day. Or if I want and I'm really itching for it, I could go to any other gym in the local area that I'm in and find a place where I can maybe get a temporary two-week little, you know, um, membership or maybe I can sign up for a trial and then cancel it before it kind of credits my account something along those kind of lines but or I could just do what I did beforehand and just go outside and do my workouts outside like do my running and whatnot do my my workouts of the day push-ups sit-ups squats pull-ups and stuff and burpees which I stopped doing for a long time, which, you know, makes a lot of sense because it's excruciating, but it also makes a lot of sense why I'm not as slivet or skinny as I want to be because before I had, I was doing the gym. Plus, on top of that, as like auxiliary um, work, I was also going out and doing a wad every single day or maybe every other day outside. So that would include, like I said, you know, some key workouts like sit-ups, push-ups and squats and then burpees and all, the, all this other stuff involved in between and shuttle runs and whatnot. So it's no wonder I was able to look like a Rick Owens model back then and not so much now. So, you know, maybe begrudgingly I have to do that in order to kind of fill in my little gym gap that I have at the moment. But another good bit of news I have that I thought I would announce here on the pod is that I finally, finally secured my Berlin dates in terms of me going over there for a little weekend to go and splurge, to go and you know get crazy have a bit of a dance and just enjoy myself for an extended weekend break now the funny thing is i actually booked this i think sometime you know at the end of the year i think i booked it maybe novemberish times but then um i just didn't have time to go basically i was kind of chock a block at work and i didn't really have the time or the weather or when to go I just you know something i just kind of booked on a whim i didn't really have a plan behind it but what i kept doing it was i kept putting it off because on ryanair or most budget airlines, you obviously can't get refunds, you can only rebook, but I guess because I was book, rebooking it so far ahead, it wasn't charging me, it was just letting me just book and just pay the difference, but then I think because I tried to book it, or I tried to change the dates again closer to the date, it then had this weird thing where you have to pay a £45 rebooking fee, so it doesn't matter if your flight is 22 or 100 you have to pay 44 first and then whatever difference is, so it ends up being a lot more money, so... Uh, I end up having to just waste the flight, which is annoying. But hey, what can you do? And now going forward, I want to make sure if I'm definitely going, if I'm when they're going on holiday, especially if it's a Ryanair flight, I have to decide, hey, are you going or not? You can't, you know, you can't just book these things and the women change your mind because if you do change your mind, you're going to be, you know, wasting loads of money for the sake of it. But I've already booked a, a little weekend. I can't wait in the new year. That should be fun. I'm really looking forward to going to that place called um, Hop Tossy. Hop Tossy, however you pronounce it, the boat. Um, which is kind of near Kreuzberg, if I'm not mistaken. It's a really nice spot um, where they do parties at. It's kind of a bit claustrophobic because it's legitimately on the boat um, and there's kind of the ceilings or whatever, it's, or the roof, sorry, it's really, really low, especially for someone as tall as I am. So it's going to be a bit of an issue, but I do like the vibe of it. Um, it gets really hot in there also, not much air conditioning. And, you know, being trapped in a little boat with like a hundred other people dancing and sweating your faces off, it can get a little bit musty in there. But what I do like about it is that the music policy is mainly disco and house, which is a little bit different from the general, you know, flipping um, overdone nature of techno in that city. As much as I do love techno, it is all a little bit one note. It's all just hardcore, 
it's all techno it's all trance it's all that kind of vibe even jungle you don't really get that much of you maybe just get just loads of alternates in terms of um techno even i think i think about just now you don't even get many places that play ebm like electronic body music you don't get many places that play electro and you'd imagine there'd be or even synth pop I can't really think of many places in Berlin. Maybe the club nights that exist that play that sort of stuff, but I can't think of specific venues that play that sort of stuff. The only closest thing I think I can think of is maybe the event that I might go to in Berghain, um, called Italo Rama, I think. And that's gonna be mostly an Italo discos type of event. But I'm sure they're gonna have a lot of synth pop um play there as well. A lot of maybe EBM played also there because it's sort of like, you know, there's some sort of overlaps in terms of the genres and the sounds and maybe some electro. But I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to have a great time. I know I am. I'm going to plan to go to, again, that Hop Tossy place. Obviously going to go to Paloma, my new discovery that I'm absolutely in love with. And then check out Oxy. And the one that I really want to see internally because I've never got to see what it actually looks like is RSO Club. And RSO, if you're not familiar with it, was the... um was the regen of Griesmüller, the legendary Berlin club. So when Griesmüller shut down, the people behind it set up this new club called RSO. And um, the lineups there are pretty decent. Um, I've been told the sound system there is really good. I've been told the crowd can be a little bit hit, hit and miss, but still, I'm looking forward to going. So it should be fun. But yeah, man, looking forward to that in the new year. So that's something to get excited about. And then towards the end of this year, um, not much really on really in terms of party-wise. Um, there might be an occasion, like I said earlier, to go to maybe Unfold um, on the New Year's Day. I think the Sunday or whatever it may be. Is it the Sunday, I think? Unfold's meant to be on. I'm not really too sure. Let me double check. Yeah, it's a Sunday. So it might be a New Year's Day vibe to go there and see what that's saying and bring in a New Year that way. But apart from that, not much else going on, man. Just winding down the year nice and slow and taking things easy. But if you're watching this video portion of the podcast, you may have noticed I look absolutely mad. My hair is all unbraided, right? It's all kind of been loosened up and shit. My facial hair is growing at a really ridiculous pace. I've got that thing going where I know I haven't shaved in a while because I've got my moustache that's slowly but surely growing and kind of overlapping my top lip to the point where you don't be able to see my top lip and I have big lips. So imagine not being able to see my top lip. That means my hair is, my facial hair is growing at an immense pace. But I'm kind of liking the look of my hair on top. I feel like, again, the camera isn't the best. But I feel like my hair looks the healthiest it's ever looked. And that's mostly because I've had it in braids. And usually, again, this is a really gross thing to admit. But usually, I'm the type of person who maybe showers twice a day, but doesn't let water touch my hair. Not to a crazy amount. Like, I won't, sh I won't, like, wash it when it's like this or shower it too often. Maybe once every two weeks or whatnot. But I found when I, when I braid my hair, what happens is that it gets really itchy, right? Your scalp and stuff. And... The only way to, you know, alleviate that itch is to wash it and to keep it somewhat um, moisturized and, you know, and whatever it may be and put the oils and whatnot in there. So I'm having to constantly wash my hair and keep it somewhat um, moisturized, which is then allowing the hair to grow well. It's, it's allowing, you know, the hair to be in far better condition. But also the braids, I feel like in general, just help Afro hair, especially the hair that I've got in this type of length. It just helps it to grow in a much more healthy way. And whenever I take out the braids, I feel like my hair's got a bit more bounce to it, a little bit more life to it. It just feels and looks way better than it did prior when I was just letting it run free and it wasn't growing and it just kind of stagnated for a few years. So I've definitely seen a lot of length in my hair as well. I can definitely tell. You can see one of these bits here. You can tell how long it's getting there. All right, it's getting mad, 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 mad long. But um, yeah, I'm happy with that. So I'm probably going to continue braiding it um, as we go forward. So hopefully get that done maybe sometime this week. But I'm liking the state of my hair but a quick one to touch up on this because i thought this is absolutely hilarious i'm sure most of you guys have seen this but this is salt bay somehow managed to find his way on the pitch during argentina's celebration of the world cup and he basically tried to clout chase and annoy leon um, messi as he's on the pitch there you know celebrating and kind of soaking in the moment and everyone's kind of gone crazy about it on social media but the funny thing with me when i saw this video is that it reminded me so much of scenarios I've seen in nightclubs where people have been trying to get the attention of a DJ, trying to go in a DJ booth, trying to go in a green room, and just trying to be a part of the kind of inner circle of a DJ or whatnot. And it's always very cringe because I, you, I could never, as much as I love you know, nightlife, I love dance music, I'm a DJ myself, I could never sit here in good conscience and say a DJ is worth 
that level of annoyance and you know fanfaring as a football is as a footballer is i don't think so i don't think they're in the same sort of universe at all zero if anything i'm a very big proponent in telling people especially on my own pod to leave djs alone if you're gonna go out and party go and party have a good time do loads of drugs drink a lot but you don't need to communicate with these djs most of them are flipping you know not the smartest or brightest people in the world some of them aren't really the greatest to hang out with and usually the best thing that they're put on this earth to do is to play really amazing sets and to craft and to, you know, provide a soundtrack to your night out. But they're not there as a weird kind of um, proxy to be your friend or something. It's not going to work that way. But I feel like with footballers, it's different because, you know, essentially sports is like a religion. Less so than maybe dance music or nightlife could be to some people. I think if you if you regard nightlife as a religion and stuff, you probably need to give yourself a little, a little bit of a hard look in the mirror. But I can kind of understand it with a footballer but I can't understand of a DJ, but it still looks extremely, extremely cringe when you see it happening with a footballer, especially when you, you know, when you kind of figure into it, Salt Bay's own level of celebrity and the fact that I'm sure he gets annoyed when people do this to, to him. Imagine him then doing it at Messi, especially during this moment where it's a kind of, you know, monumental, you know, moment for Messi in his career, monumental for Argentina overall. It's a World Cup, whatever it may be called. Why the fuck is Selpo on the pitch celebrating with them? But I felt the video was absolutely hilarious. So I'm going to play it now. And if you guys are watching or listening via the audio podcast, essentially it's just the Argentina team on the pitch, all their friends and family and people associated with, I guess, with the Argentina FA, you know, basically basking in the glory of this World Cup and somehow Salt Bay, the Turkish legend, finds his way on there and tries to get the attention of Messi by tapping him on the shoulder and wanting to get a hug or hang out or have some sort of conversation about the game. I don't know, but it's really cringe. <laughs> <laughs> Salt Bay like taps Messi on the shoulder, tries to get his attention. Messi sees him, shakes his hand, and keeps walking. And Salt Bay keeps trying to grab him and trying to bring him into his embrace. Clearly, Messi's just not on that time. And there's nothing more embarrassing than those sort of occasions when you see somebody and you have one expectation of how that interaction is going to go. Because for sure, Salt Bay's last interaction with Messi was a fairly jubilant one, I'm assuming. Maybe Messi came to his restaurant, he force-fed him some fucking horrible meats, and his family were having a good time, they took lots of pictures. So in his head, he has this vision of Messi in his restaurant, smiling and, you know, holding, you know, hugging each other for a picture and stuff, and then him getting the assumption that they're friends. So when he sees them on the pictures, he's like, oh yeah, that's the Messi that I remember. Not knowing that Messi in his head thinking, this guy's a fucking prick, this guy's a fucking prick, this guy's a fucking prick. And when he sees him again, oh shit, it's that fucking prick. And he shakes his hand and keeps it moving. He doesn't take the hint because he's still in his head thinking, oh no, that's my friend. No, brother, he's not your friend. And the same thing goes for the people that try to clout chase DJs in venues or whatnot. Leave them alone. For the most part, leave them alone. If it's not a quick hi or a quick I love what you do, big fan of this EP, keep doing your thing, leave them alone you don't need to give them any conversation they do not care about you especially if they're a top class dj or top tier sorry dj they're probably on their fourth set in that one day you know traveling between four countries in however many hours they're probably running on zero sleep a bag full of ketamine or something else and the last thing they want to do is have an interaction with you um you know in any kind of meaningful or, or surface level way just wave spud whatever it may be called blow kisses heart sign and keep it moving you don't need to do anything else zero 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 but i see people doing this all the time and it's kind of part of that whole sort of world if anything it kind of reminds you a little bit of that legend that guy that i saw um in fabric one time and i had a really interesting conversation with him in the green room and he's the guy that's always standing behind ricardo villalobos or sometimes he's around sven var i remember reading in comments someone said that he might be sven var's brother or something he's a dude that's got like a ponytail and he's just always around i'm not sure if he's a manager or the booking agent but he's always just around lingering and um he's always a person who's always kind of going out of his way to hug everybody and do this and pat people on the back and just make it known that he's part of the inner circle of the of people. And I feel people like, I feel like that's the, the thing that you see a lot in nightlife. You see a lot of people doing that oftentimes, trying to kind of subtly signal, oh, I know this person. I know that person. It's like, no one cares. Just go and rave, pay your ticket, dance, have a good time and go home. At least for me anyway. Mostly when I'm going out, I'm going out for my own self enjoyment, which is a bit, you know, G-A-Y 
and a little bit lonely because I'm going out on my own for my own enjoyment. I should maybe be there with a crew or with a partner and stuff and having a good time. But whatever, I'm the way that I am. People are made differently. Some people like to have big groups of friends. I like to just be on my own and having a good time with a bag and a key and just raving and having a good little evening. But some people just want to signal subtly to everybody around them. Look, I know him. I know her. I know them. I know th whatever. It's like, stop it. Relax. Like, just chill out. And if you don't chill out, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to get investigated. He's currently being investigated, which is funny because he, he's been investigated by FIFA. But if you believe the rumors um, online, the head of FIFA, which is Gianno Infantano, this absolute bald prick, he's the person who got Salt Bay on the pitch in the first place because him and Salt Bay have struck up some level of friendship because of the times he's visited his restaurants, you know, so often, which I don't really understand because Salt Bay restaurants, for the most part, have got terrible reviews. And from the videos that I've seen, the only thing he adds to it are the theatrics he does when he's cutting up the food and doing the whole Salt Bay sprinkle thing. But be, to be fair to the guy, he's really made this grift and this sort of a scam um, last a very, very long time. Most people would have kind of, you know, their five minutes of fame, they would have gone by, but he's somehow been able to stretch this five minutes of fame for ages and ages and ages. It's not ended. It keeps on going. Here he is, you know what I mean? Like with Jonathan Ventana doing the whole salt based sprinkle thing. Jonathan Ventana trying to act like he's a cool guy and with the lads and whatnot. It's absolutely cringe. But luckily, the guy's getting investigated and hopefully we'll see the end of this super theatric. So this is courtesy of Sky Sports News. It says salt based World Cup final antics on the pitch being investigated by FIFA. Uh, FIFA is investigating the circumstances which led to Salt Bay gut crashing the Argentina World Cup celebrations in Qatar. The celebrity restaurant owner, whose real name is Nusret Gochi, or Go Goche, how do you pronounce that? Nusret Gochi, um, was seen on the pitch after the final trying to take selfies with Argentina players. No, he wasn't trying to, he did take them. He even got to hold the fucking World Cup, which you're not even meant to hold if you're a basic civilian. It's, a, it's sort of a privilege maybe somebody can give to you to hold it, but you're not meant to go out your way to try and grab it. You didn't play. Relax. If people were taking the piss out of Sergio Aguero for jumping on the pitch and celebrating with the team as if you played, how much more for flipping Salt Bay? What the hell is he doing on the pitch? FIFA has told Sky Sports his access to the pitch was unauthorized and its rules state that only World Cup winners and heads of state are allowed to touch the trophy during the closing ceremony. That doesn't even make any sense. Why are heads of states allowed to touch the World Cup? And why are World Cup winners, what previous ones, why are they even there on the pitch when a particular nation, when it's not their nation that they won it with prior, that's won it, like, or that's on the pitch. That doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, we continue. Look, this is him with Angel Di Maria doing that annoying face that he does. Um, and it continues here. The spokesman for FIFA said, following a review, FIFA has been establishing how individuals gained undue access to the pitch after the closing ceremony at the Luce Luce Sai Stadium on December 18th. The appropriate internal action will be taken. It is understood that Salt Bay has no involvement with FIFA president. Yes, he does. Look at this. Look at this cop out they're trying to do in, this, in the statement. It is understood that Salt Bay has no involvement with FIFA president Giano Infantino who has previously been pictured visiting one of his restaurants. It's also believed that there is no commercial relationship between... Yes, there is. Yes, there is. He definitely got Gianni Ventano on his fucking WhatsApp and said, hey, brother, can you sort me out? What's the motive? Link me. Do you know what I mean? Let's link and build. Let's do this thing. And he got invited. Let's not lie. Sopel was one of the Infantano's 303 Instagram followers at 6 p.m. on Thursday. But as of 7 p.m. on Thursday, he has been unfollowed. Ah! Oh! <laughs> Infantano trying to make it not bait. Yeah, right. The circus celebrity as chef has become known by his pseudonym Salt Bay since rising to fame on social media for his unique style of seasoning steaks. Um, now the host of a... Uh, what's that? Now uh, a host of stars at this restaurant... Uh, sorry, now a host to the stars of res at his restaurants, Salt Bay's presence among the celebrity anti the players caused a storm on social media, which the new world champions um, appearing to be apathetic to his involvement. <laughs> exactly! Come on, man! Messi was pictured trying to appear to get away from the celebrity chef Gabby Zama. Alessandro Martinez looked less than that to be pictured alongside him holding the World Cup trophy. A compilation video on, on Twitter of non plus players alongside Gok racked up more than 50, 40 million views since it was posted on Monday afternoon. And I guess this is the video up here, right? Where he's clearly trying to make himself part of the flipping um, situation. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. So I can't watch this. It's too cringe. 
It's too cringe. I can't. I can't. It's just too cringe. I cannot do it. Look at even a kid. Look at what's his name? Um, what's his name? Uh, Christian Romero's kid grabbing the trophy, like saying, "No, that's my dad's. What are you doing? Give it back here." Look, even the even the baby knows Salt Bay is a fucking weapon. Like, give it back here, you little short cunt. I know I'm short, but you're shorter. Give it back here. Absolute disgrace. Absolute disgrace. But yeah, glad that FIFA are investigating him. It's funny that his own friends are investigating him for allowing him access on the pitch. And then try to unfollow him to kind of cover his tracks. But it's too late, Gianno Infantino, you bald prick. Hopefully he gets flipping um, exposed very, very soon. Because that guy is obviously one of the most annoying people that's ever existed. Especially when it comes to FIFA. We replaced Set Blatter with him. He thought corruption's ended. But it just keeps on keeping on. Moving on with that one. We've got some very interesting news, I feel like. Something I don't feel like I've seen in a very, very long time. This is obviously off the back of those two really tragic deaths at Brixton Academy um, during the Asake concert here in London, where two people unfortunately um, died as a result of the crush and the stampede outside of the venue, where loads of ticketless people tried to basically bum rush or gate crash the event in an effort to try and see Asake perform maybe his last date here in London. And one person died, which is a, a, a young lady who was a single mother of two, um, Rebecca Ukulmelo, I think. And the other person was called Gabby Hutchinson, I think, who was a security guard or police officer who was outside, who, you know, trying to basically keep people safe and end up dying in the line of duty. So absolutely tragic news to, to kind of relay back. But I've never seen this happen before. This is news currently um, from yesterday. It says Brixton Academy license is suspended after a fatal crush. Now, I see this stuff happening with nightclubs and whatnot. And I think I've said previous occasions that I think that's one of the annoying things about nightlife in general here in London is that whenever there's an issue, whether it's a drug overdose, whether it's something involving SA or whatnot, there's, there's very, um, on very rare occasions, is there any kind of um, idea to mediate or to educate or to kind of review and to work out solutions for, you know, avoiding such instances again, the first thing they do, the only first response to any kind of crisis involving nightlife and events is always to suspend or to close venues. Now, that happens a lot with quote-unquote independent venues, but you don't see stuff that you'd imagine is backed by Live Nation, O2, it's an established venue, Brixton Academy, losing its license you usually see a lot happening with like smaller clubs so the fact that this has happened goes to show the the kind of seriousness of the issue and maybe goes to show that maybe there are lawsuits and litigations happening in the background already that they're getting wind of so they're trying to basically appease the sentiment there by spending license but i've never seen this happening to an established venue in a very very long time or maybe ever this courtesy of bbc news it says the Brixton O2 Academy's license has been suspended as it emerged concerns were raised about the strength of the front doors nearly three years before the fatal crush at the concert last week. Ah, it's all coming out now. Afro-pop singer Ashake um, gig was cut short when a number of uh, a large number of people tried to enter the foyer on Thursday. Rebecca Ukumelo, 33, died on Saturday, while Gabby Hutchinson died on Monday. The South London venue's license has been suspended until January 16th. So no events are going to go on until the 16th and maybe longer. Lambeth Council has met earlier and decided to take the internal, the interim decision to suspend the Academy's license following the severity of the events and the risk to the public safety from a lack of crowd control at the front doors until a full hearing takes place on January 16th. During the council meeting, the Metropolitan Police said that there had been a similar crush on the 2nd of February 2020 when concerns were raised about the strength of the doors uh, during a concert with Naira Marley. Really? Naira Mali calls that much of a crush, routed, um, another Afrobeat singer. The funny thing is, I had been there for a Travis Scott concert. I went there, what else I went there for? I can't think. Travis Scott, what else? Something, I remember, saw something else I went there. Maybe a metal gig also. And it's always been a bit of a sketchy Hellraiser type of venue. But never to this sort of level. The one thing I always remember from Moto Brixton Academy is just the entrance is so weird. Because they make you basically queue down one side road to come back up to the front where the venue is. So when you're walking up to the venue, you kind of feel like you can go in, but you can't. You go down the side road, then they let you go in that way. But then sometimes if you queue long enough and you look up at the front of the queue, you see some people walking in through the front door. I'm not sure if they're VIP or if they're the bouncers. It's a very strange way of going in and out of that venue. It didn't make any sense. The crowd management, I feel like when you're inside, wasn't too bad. 
they did a good job of like making sure people you know if you went to go to the toilets or went to go buy merch or to the bar it's pretty easy to get in and out i feel like so i hit the mic again but when it comes to trying to get into the venues it's always been a bit of a nightmare to be honest but again r.i.p rebecca and gabby man absolutely tragic it says the police um, force wanted Lambeth Council Licensing Subcommittee to suspend the license throughout the, the investigation. The owner has instead offered to remain closed for 28 days. Okay, see, this is the venue offering to do so. So for sure, there are some lawsuits in the work. One show has already been postponed and another on New Year's Eve has been cancelled. Five more shows due to take place between now and January 16th will be postponed. Um, at the meeting, lawyer representing the police said the owner's offer to temporary cuts was inappropriate and wrong. It's not right it's just to leave the decision as serious as this in the hands of the licensee. Whilst that has happened last Thursday, of course, was exceptional. No one should begin to think that it was unique or could not happen again. Look at that, man. So, yeah, that's... If you just look at the sky view of the outside venue of Brixton Academy, if I'm not mistaken, this way here towards the left-hand side, you see of this picture, is where Brixton Station is. So you kind of walk around this way. And you feel like you can just walk in like that, but you actually can't. You have to actually queue down this way. Most most of the time, security make you queue like this. And then when you go out, you all go out this way. You go out one way or maybe through one or two of these doors. But sometimes if you queue long enough, you'll see people walking through this way. I'm not sure if they're VIP or if they've got O2 priority or something. But it's a very strange place to be in, in around. And this whole road anyway is very busy. Um, it's the main strip in Brixton. All the shops are here. The famous KFC is always up there where people always get shot and beaten up and whatnot. There's a McDonald's too, I think, somewhere around here. And loads of other Caribbean restaurants and whatnot. So it's always a big... And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's even a Morley's down the right, down this side, I think, if I'm not mistaken, as you come out towards the left. So it's a very popular juncture. So I can just imagine the amount of people that are in and around that place anyway, waiting just for, you know, to see what the vibe was after the event. People that just, you know, hang, that would be there anyway. But then maybe because there's a famous Afro beats, Afro pop singer playing at the venue, it attracts more people outside. Plus people that were already there to go and see the show. Plus the ones that were getting firmer and didn't have a ticket and went to come and sneak in. Because I'm sure that's the thing that happens often at Brixton Academy. If you are clever, uh, because there's so many entrances and so many different points of entry and exit, you could probably sneak in there if you are quite determined to do so. I'm sure some people have kind of figured it out, which is probably why a lot of people went out there and tried to chance it. And if it wasn't already sold out, they probably would have worked it out anyway. Or if maybe if the amount of people that didn't have tickets wasn't so excessive, then it probably wouldn't have been such an issue. But I feel like because it was already sold out and the amount of people that came there was, to people are saying anywhere between 1,000 to 3,000, it just became too much to bear. And unfortunately, people had to lose their lives. But again, I've never in my life seen an established venue like an O2 lose their license off the back or something like this. This is really, really serious. Um, Steph, um, sorry, Stephen Walsh, KC, representing the Academy Music Group, told councillors, it is clearly far too early as the police have accepted to draw any conclusions about the cause of the tragedy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let alone the point the finger at blame at any party. And, okay, he's a lawyer, so I guess he has to do what he has to do. The O2 Academy Brixton recognizes the gravity of the events which occurred on the night of December 15th and expresses its sincere condolences to the families of those who died during the tragic event and its genuine concerns for anyone affected by it. License holder Academy Group Music Limited is committed to ensuring these vital lessons are learned through its own detailed internal investigation. So they're trying their best to appease all the kind of people blaming them and saying they're going to do their internal investigation. And also they're kind of subtly saying without saying that they obviously plan to reopen as soon as the investigation is over. The first sold out concert in a week of a shake had to be cut short when a large number of people tried to enter the venue. Gabby Hutchison, 23, from Gravesend in Kent, who died following a crush, was a security contractor working at the venue. Nursing graduate Rebecca Ukumelo from Newham, East London, who also died the following days, was a mother of two children. And like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure if she's from my borough, then I probably know her via some other people you know, within my same age range and whatnot. A 21-year-old woman is, remains in critical condition in the hospital. Hopefully she recovers and gets well very, very soon. And the summary review is a fast-track review process brought by the police when they consider the premises concerned is involved in a serious crime. Councillor Fred said the interim suspension, given the severity of the events of December 15th, the risk to the public safety as a consequence of a particular serious disorder rising from the lack of crowd control at the front of the doors of the venue remains high if the venue are able to operate as before. So I guess we're going to see what happens 
after the 16th and get an idea what the deal is. But we know who to blame. We have to blame the people who arrived there without tickets. And also you have to blame the security and uh, crowd control outside of the venue. It's pretty blatant who was at fault here. But, you know, with these sort of things, many, many bits of monies are on the line and whatnot. So they have to obviously do the best they can to um, skirt and avoid any responsibility because responsibility means compensation. And compensation could basically mean the risk of the business going completely under. So it makes complete sense. But it is quite sickening to see because people's lives are actually lost. And the first thing these people are worried about is their money and whatnot. It's absolutely disgusting. But hey, hopefully some lessons are learned from this and we kind of do go on to do better going forward. You can only hope one can only hope let's continue here uh, let's continue here oh let's go there have you guys seen this i'm not really too familiar with spider i guess because i live in the uk and i don't necessarily um have uh any real extensive knowledge when it comes to snowboarding brands or ski brands or whatnot because we don't generally wear that type of stuff because it's not you know it never snows that hard it's cold but you don't necessarily need to have ski wear or whatnot to be able to combat this sort of cold usually a couple of hoodies and a scarf will go a long way for you but it looks like supreme is collaborating with one that's fairly well known and by the looks of the and by the reaction i've seen online people are really hyped for this so this is courtesy of supreme it's a supreme spider american ski apparel company spider was founded in 1978 by david jacobs a championship winning skier and coach of the canadian national ski team by the late 1970s jacobs had noticed his only one brand of slalom um, sweater was available on the global ski racing circuit and felt he could develop a better product which sounds very similar to the supreme origin stories right of like james jeb you're going to a skate store and seeing how cool the skaters were but also being disappointed that they didn't have accurate um, or they didn't have appropriate clothing that kind of matched their cultural impact that they were having, you know, in the, at the times he was going to places and he thought you could offer something better than what the skate brands were offering at that time. But if you've got brands like Alpha and New American, all that sort of stuff. Um, he established a mail order business based out of his kitchen and soon broadened his offering to a range of padded ski jack padded ski sweatshirts and pants as well as racing accessories. Over the following decade, Spider developed new technologies in 1994. Oh, see, this is when the Supreme was launched. The company was granted a patent on its spied on its speed wire racing suits designed to streamline airflow and reduce wind drag. By 997, after multiple U.S. ski team athletes won World Cup downhill wearing the enhanced wear, Industrial Ski Federation banned technology, claiming that it had resulted in unfair advantage. Wow, similar to those um, what are those Nike running shoes with the carbon um little midsole thing that was making you spring off the floor higher or faster so that people they banned those in terms of racing and i forgot what they're called though um it continues yes the spider has been the official supplier of the u.s ski teams and australia austrian and canadian ski teams today is one of the largest ski specialists ski speciality brands in the world and remains globally known for its performance in innovation okay fair enough not really too familiar with the brand itself but the clothing looks really um impressive i'm not really too mad at it if anything the spider stuff does remind me a lot of the young thug brand i forgot what the name of it was called maybe it is spider i forgot the name the kind of graphics it does kind of relay back to it so maybe this is why they've got kind of always been going in that respect just making sure the flipping thing is loading now the flipping page is being unresponsive brilliant let's exit this and start again because clearly my computer cannot handle the supreme website i think i read recently or somebody told me that the supreme website or the people behind it were going to move to shopify because i think now it's not on shopify it's whatever platform they use but allegedly that's the whole kind of rumor behind the scenes that they're gonna move it to shopify or it's not gonna be on this sort of thing so i think this is designed by splay in it from back in the day it, if you tell me on og if you remember the splay forums back in the day i was i remember being a part of that one and i remember for a period of time it was members or it was invite only but I remember getting on there. So if you remember that part of history, then let me know in the comments down below. Display forum days. That was a real, real, real OG season. But yeah, there's a loads of uh, tracksuits involved here with that really cool spider type crackled, you know, um, print on there on the top, which I really like. The fleece looks amazing. I like the face mask. Um, obviously, the pants and the fleece will be really, really popular. What are those shoes he's wearing? That's a bandoo, isn't it? What are those? Are those Vans? Okay, they are. So they're Vans Authentics in like this weird crushed velvet type style. Very, very bandoogie. I like the skull gloves. They're very nice. 
but I guess they're not supreme. But I do like that they're doing this often. I remember this is a thing that they've obviously started in recent seasons. This sort of thing where they like they give the people who are modeling their clothes, they just let let them wear their own shit. You know, it's like styled by own. So it's kind of mixed in. It's not just a head to toe supreme look. I, I kind of like that. And the fact that some of their, especially footwear stuff, the people actually, or the models wearing them are actually wearing the shoes day in, day out. So you get to see the shoe brand new in box. And you also get to see it worn by somebody that's actually wearing it day to day. I like this also. There's like a long sleeve racing type top that looks really cool. Um, there's a pair of gloves. I don't know if the gloves are connected to the top itself. I'm not too sure. A nice face mask looking jibe as well going on there. It's funny how different these masks are looking now in a post-pandemic world, isn't it? They're starting to look more like masks than they were prior. Before they were prior, they were looking like an alternative to wearing a, a flipping, um, what they called, N95. Now they look like you're going to rob a bank if you go into a shop like this. I'd imagine some places will ask you to kind of lift up your mask so they can see your face just one time. So that's probably a thing. But yeah, there's a, there's a web polar fleece that looks really cool. That'll, look, that'll probably you know, keep you all insulated throughout the flipping winter months. It's a nice kind of Spider-Man type colorway with a red and blue. I like that. Really, really cool looking. The grey colorway is really nice as well. But I'm assuming the black and grey and the blue colorway will probably be the most um, popular ones in terms of people trying to cop. Then you've got the matching pants also that look really nice. Drawstrings at the bottom, which is cool. I'm not a fan of the elasticated bottoms underneath. I hate that shit. But drawstring just to kind of pull them in if you want to. That's nice. The zips on the pockets, I'm not really a fan of either. I hate when you have zips in your pockets and you put your hands in them and you're feeling the zip kind of rubbing against your skin. It's just don't, not a fan. I'd rather have a flap with a button and um, snapping them in or just some slits that you can put your hands in, all in. But, you know, maybe considering these are meant to be kind of ski wear or active wear type pants, maybe you need to have a zip in them in case you want to, you know, carry around your flipping iPhone or your GoPro in your pocket and whatnot. So that probably does make some level of sense. More pants. And you've got this um, top, which is called what? A web half zip pullover, which is pretty decent as well. It doesn't come with a matching glove. So whatever gloves that kid had on the white gloves are definitely something maybe purchased separately. I do like the look of it though. That graphic is really nice, isn't it? That spider, it's sort of like a metallic spider web. It looks pretty, pretty cool. I'm a big fan. That'll probably be very popular as well with some of the kiddies. And then you've got the, what you call it? The, the Badaclava as well, which is really nice as well. With we'll the spider logo on it and Supreme text written on it also. So that's definitely going to be a very popular piece for some people out there. But yeah, all in all, not too shabby. Um, when's the date of this meant to be releasing? I'm pretty sure it's been releasing sometime today, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Um, over the following decade, uh, the Supreme has worked with Spider on the new collection for 2022. The collection consists of a fleece jacket, fleece pant, long sleeve top, and balaclava, and will release on December 22nd today, and as well in Japan on December 24th. So if you want that, definitely make sure you cop it. It's going to be available right now. Next on the list, we have to talk about, of course, we have to talk about Kiff and their incredible, incredible collaboration with Solomon. Something that I didn't think I would be a fan of, but I'm slowly but surely coming over to Flipping Solomon's. Maybe I'm coming over them or coming on them, but I'm definitely becoming a fan of the brand and the shoes. I definitely am. And I think maybe because they don't look as boxy or as you know uh, lumpy as i thought they did when i saw them prior maybe because i've seen a few of them in person now i've started to like how slim and sleek they look and maybe as well with the weather being how it is here in the uk it's probably the best type of shoe to be wearing on a day in day out basis but these colorways that kiff have put together with solomon are definitely definitely some of the best i've seen in a very long time this is courtesy of kiff it says the model features a gore-tex pfc free membrane for breathability and protection from the elements as well as a sensi fit construction for a snug and secure fit the emergent cell acs midsole provides stability and comfort with the mud counter grip outsole ensures maximum grip the quick lace system allows for easy one pull lacing and the tongues includes kiff branding and a custom woven label Early access for the free color is available on Kif for Solomon. The XT6 Gore-Tex is open now, exclusively on the Kif app. These are also released on Monday the 19th, which I'm sure they already sold out on Kif.com and EU and blah, blah, blah. 
but the three colors they've put together of these are really 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 impressive you got this kind of nice brown color where you'd say here mostly a nice purple violet and then a bluish kind of green at the back there my favorite for sure i would say is definitely the purple or the blue um, I feel like I've seen, you know, as, as inventive and as kind of um, creative as these colorways are, I feel like I've seen that brownie type of colorway in other places. But this purple and this blue are definitely ones that you probably wouldn't see um, Solomon do in line. And they're definitely things that you'd see more related to collaboration. So I'm definitely more of a fan of those because, you know, there's no point in getting shoes like this in collabs. You're not going to get the colors ways that people don't usually get in terms of these sort of collabs and look at that with a little purple hit too on the back of the heel that kind of plastic thing that goes around the back looks really cool um i would have preferred maybe some more kiff branding all over it but yeah the solomon heel tab thing doesn't look too shabby you got kiff here written on the insoles also you've got the gore-tex label here towards the front and you've got the custom woven pull tab label thing on the on the tongue there written with kiff but the purple ones and the blue ones look really, 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 really flames. I'm a real big fan of those overall. And I think they look absolutely stupendous. And I don't know. I don't know why it took me so long to get onto the whole Solomon vibe. Because I feel like, if anything, when you consider the amount of interest I have in flipping um, ACGs and whatnot, I should have been into these things a long, long time ago. It makes no sense that it took me so long to get on board them. But I think like most things in life, you know, it's mostly to do with the fans. The people I see wearing Philippine Solomons or wearing Arterix and stuff, Arterix, are usually people that I don't want to be associated with in any kind of way. So when I see them wearing these sort of brands, the first thing I want to do is not wear the brand. But sometimes you got to call a spade a spade. When something's fire, it's fire. And I feel like these are really, really good. Especially when you consider that they're meant to be cross-training, cross-running adventure um, type shoes, right? Um, or hiking shoes, whatever it may be called. And most of those shoes, I reckon, for the most part, aren't the most aesthetically pleasing but what solomon do really well with these shoes is that they are a good mixture of like a traditional sneaker that you would anticipate you would wear and also something that is also somewhat functional and does exactly what it says on the tin but this sort of again i'm thinking about it now looking on the screen this color that i didn't like the most the kind of brownie burgundy-ish kind of colorway is actually kind of fire also i think they're all good do you know i wouldn't be mad at any 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 colorway but I do like those first two prior. I think they look really, really cool. That that um the the lacing system is pretty interesting. So if you're not seeing them on top on lacing system, they basically got these pull strings that you're basically meant to pull and then put your foot in, so you don't need to lace up and whatnot. I'm assuming that's more so if you're outdoors and your hands are compromised or whatnot or cold or you're getting frostbite or you basically chop them off. You have the ability to still kind of pull your laces up together by just kind of yanking here on this little doodah at the top of the tongue but the one thing that's really odd is how long the excess kind of tongue rope material is that you're meant to kind of pull on and i guess this bend is that there permanently is there like a metal kind of rods in between the laces that you kind of meant to bend and kind of pull or is this just a style thing you're meant to do over time i'm not really too sure but i wonder if that's the thing that happens a lot or if people get them taken off or what i'm not really too sure but i do like it it's kind of inventive kind of creative I'm sure if you wanted to, you could take off the laces completely or the pull tabs and just wear them without it and it will probably keep your foot somewhat snug inside because I'm sure there's probably an elastic that keeps his tongue down and whatnot and the fit themselves kind of lend itself to kind of not wearing them with any kind of lacing system or tongue. But I like them. I like every single pair of them. I think they look really cool. Big fan of them. So here, yeah, racing product as you can see on the top. And yeah, the blue color, that bluish green colorway is just, oh, might be one of the best and this is really really nice this is lush as hell you see the little sky blue here heel counter the pop she's going towards the front more here this kind of um it looks like a fly wire type material but i'm assuming there's some sort of tensioning cordy things underneath these little white bits that look like a's or triangles and then when you pull the laces they sort of kind of clamp your foot in so maybe it's important to actually keep the uh, the lace system on there actually but it doesn't look like yeah looking at the lacing system it doesn't look like it's got any kind of metal rod that's on front probably just a pull they just do to make sure that it kind of stays the stuff down but these look really fire they look really cool uh big up Solomon for putting them together big big fan of these 
and I cannot wait to see them in person when people do wear them in and around town with me. And if I'm able to buy them on the resale, let me actually check quickly my phone StockX to see what it's saying. Because I'm curious to see if they if you're able to buy these things on a resale. Let's see what the vibe is here. Du, 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 du. Let's go here. Let's go to Google say Solomon Kiff. Let's see how much they're available on, on flipping StockX. I don't see them available anywhere on StockX just yet. Interesting. Not available yet? Okay, let me let me type in StockX at the end. Maybe I didn't put in that at the end, but usually if you type that in on Google, it comes up straight away. If I type in StockX at the end of that, would it show up and how much would they be? I'm going to say 300 just as a guess now. Let's see if they're available now. I'm going to say 300. Solomon Kiff Gore-Tex. Was that X? Was that XTX, right? Oh, yeah. See? 250. As you can see there, they're 250 actually. Can you see that there? Oh. Put that over there. 250. Can you see that? That's the pair there. They're 250. Not too shabby, isn't it? 250. I think that's all right for that blue pair. And okay, the most expensive colorway, funnily enough, is the purple. Wow, my one's okay. The most expensive colorway is a brown. No, it's the purple, then the brown. That violet y type, um, what they call it? They call it Moonscape. So Moonscape is the most expensive, 294. And then the other one is the um, Burnt Henna, which is 283. And then the one I've got on screen now, the blue is 247 interesting isn't it? you wouldn't think that but it would work out that way but yeah big up those i like them um big up kiff again you know whenever you think you're you're flipping over kiff and they've done it all and they've kind of exhausted your patience with collaborations they always come and hit you over the head of another one and tell you to shut up keep on buying you absolute cretin keep on buying so big up kiff in it <laughs> big up kiff oh mate what can you do what can you do moving on from that one i want to quickly move and talk about some fashion stuff have you guys seen diesel spring 2023 glenn martins is at it again he's at it again at it again and this is interesting for me because having read the review it seems like um glenn martins is approaching diesel um or diesel pre-collection as an option for it to be a sort of diffusion line which is something you don't usually see when a lot of these brands, and maybe because, you know, you mentioned already in the interview or in the review of the show that Diesel isn't a luxury brand in the slightest. It's just playing in that field with the hiring of him and obviously it's positioning, but it has no heritage in the luxury fashion business whatsoever. But he's still trying to kind of, you know, get it to that sort of level. But in order to kind of attract the general consumer who maybe is familiar with Diesel, mostly through their denim and their kind of regular streetwear type, type, you know, quote unquote clothes, he's using the pre- collection of the show as an option to appeal to the masses which is interesting because most brands i feel like use the pre as a precursor to the main show or to basically um showcase the stuff that was left over from the previous collection or put together some odds and ends that they want to present or just keep just basically keep that kind of content machine production machine clothing machine kind of going on so that people want to buy more things they don't have to wait until the very next season for the mainline show there's always things that you can purchase in store and whatever it may be but the one thing i wanted to mention about this that i thought was very interesting is that i wonder if this look is becoming boring this is the first look in the diesel spring 2023 collection i think that if you look at diesel overall you go to the actual page for instance on vogue runway and you just have a quick scan across some of the latest collections, especially the ones designed under um, Glenn Martin's tutelage, you'll see a lot of the same things, especially, I think it's from here, right? He starts clearly, right? From uh, spring 2023, uh, sorry, spring 2022, all the way to pre fall 2023. And I feel like this might end up going the same way of Alessandro Michele at Gucci, where a particular aesthetic or a particular look that he brings, you know, to the forefront at this brand will end up probably being a blessing and a curse because people will soon grow tired of this aesthetic and i feel like this kind of denim euro trash um aesthetic that he has going on at the moment very maybe y2k type influenced is probably going to die of natural causes very soon because even i being a fan of glenn martin's and liking what he's done so far i'm already kind of getting a little bit bored of it because you can see the you know if anything i could think all these collections from spring 2022 to pre-fall 2023 they all kind of look alike there's not a real big difference in what is 
what is there for the most part it's all kind of a bit you know one note and a little bit similar obviously the theatrics of the show the runway the flipping models that walk it the casting it's all really cool brilliant and the vibe around it and clearly glim artist is clearly an amazing and astonishing mind you see what he does at white projects and how much he brings to the table and the trends he's able to create and imagine he's able to capture but i feel like with diesel it's kind of stagnating already maybe it's just a bit of a you know impulsive thing to say now but I feel like only a few collections in already. What is one? Let's see. Collect. Let's let's make it all together. Let's do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven collections in, and already this look is getting a little bit tired. But it doesn't matter because in this pre-fall collection, there are still some really interesting bits and bobs that I saw that I really liked. I'm going to highlight here that I thought of of, of some level of interest. Um, this look here, which is look number fifteen, this all black look with this amazing bit of paneling on the side. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before. I'm a real stickler for contrast stitching and I'm a real big stickler for paneling. Like when it comes to, you know, you think of the old, you know, Japanese type style uh, fashion bits and bobs that were designed by Hiroshi Fujiwara, Jun Takashi, where you take the sleeve of a bomber jacket and you replace it with a leather sleeve or maybe half leather or maybe you do a bit of um, knitwear or whatever it may be or even a, a, you know, a classic sort of like Carhartt type straw jacket and all the stitching bits, you'd make it contrasting. I love what those little bits of detail. Not sure why, don't ask me why, but I love it. Which is why when I first saw gallery department, I immediately liked the sweatpants and jeans that they put out because of the extra bit of paneling that they put on them to make the pants a bit bigger and make them look like bell bottoms and whatnot. Over time, that look has become very tired and got very boring very quickly. But when I still see stuff like this put together, it definitely does try, you know, trigger something in me. I also like the bag here. This little tote bag with the kind of D logo embossed i feel like on the side looks really cool maybe the material from here doesn't look the bestest in terms of quality but again you can't really ascertain much from a picture taken so far the sunglasses here look pretty interesting in the background of this picture actually you've got this frame that goes around it and the glass is kind of suspended by these four different hinges that kind of hold it up together or maybe three maybe it's just these two here on the sides and this one here towards the bridge of the nose but I thought look 15 from Diesel uh, pre-4 was pretty interesting as well. Then on the next one, i quickly show you as it loads here. Take your time, your bloody nonsense computer. It says Diesel pre-4, yeah. Um, look number 19, again, one of my favorites um, for obvious reasons. You can start from the bottom. I feel like these new sneakers that he's put together are really cool. They look like a really interesting mix between like a skate shoe and something that you maybe see from like a Yeezy in terms of the bulbous sort of cloud-like midsole here at the bottom i think they look pretty awesome and then you've got these track pants sorry these combat pants that look really cool i'm not too sure what the deal is because if i'm not sure if you see this but the combat pants look like they're filled up with air or that they look like they're filled with down or something or maybe it's just the style of it was able to hook together but i do like the really excessive nature of the pockets here on the knee and towards the bottom of the pants they look really cool so i'd like to know what it makes this kind of bulbous effects on the combats and if it is someone putting loads of trousers on top of trousers or if it's the way that they've been designed in a way that they cut and they sit this way or that they actually filled with down not be too sure the backpack on the left here the, the model is holding it looks really cool also it reminds me of like the classic mountaineering backpacks that you'd see from you know other legendary mountaineering brands that i can't think of right now but I like the shape of it and everything else in between that looks pretty cool and again the bomber jacket to match the pants as well is really nice it kind of reminds me of that iconic ec miyake uh, bomber jacket that everyone goes crazy for the one that's famously worn by um robin williams back in the day r.i.p they look pretty nice and again interesting traits with the spectacles it looks like there's sunglasses on top of regular glasses there i'm not sure if that's true but that's what it kind of looks like and then continuing on, look number 32. This is more of a quintessential Glenn Martins look that like you would see for, you know, maybe an iteration or something. He'd maybe on interpretation or something he'd maybe do for White Project, but definitely for mainline Gucci in terms of his look. But I do like that he's able to take those, that kind of look and aesthetic and kind of distill it into a quasi, you know, uh, diffusion line without cheapening the product i don't feel like it's a cheap alternative it just is another version of something he's already done um so you've got this amazing what looks like fur faux fur overcoat that looks like it's reversible um on top of a nice um jacket here that's a bit cropped with a really short skirt which i'm a big fan of him returning or him kind of bringing back the extremely extremely short mini skirt um to the point where it's essentially like a belt 
<laughs> you know, it's not that it's not that thicker than the belt. I feel like it's maybe three belts thick in terms of its overall length, so that's pretty wild. And I'm pretty sure the shape of it maybe would only suit a particular type of lady. I'm sure if you have a more voluptuous buttocks, it'd be a bit more difficult to get your bum into these pants. And then you've got these nice, um, you know, mid you know calf size boots that have become really popular in the last few years as well i feel like and it's nice kind of massive d logo emblazoned on the left hand side of it let's look for some more here you've got this great collection also i feel like the tracksuit looks really cool um it's looks like if i'm not mistaken from the again just from the picture itself i don't think it's a nylon -y type material it looks like it might be regular cotton with an attached hood on it as well and he's got matching gloves which i'd like to see the look of those i'd love to get a pair of diesel gloves to wear day in day out but this is a great roadman look with some general sneakers you've got the big logo here on the side of the pants and towards the back i imagine this is going to be very popular um with rappers and people in culture in general i'm sure they're going to get a real kick out of wearing this day in day out look number 38 um continue on a couple more looks i think i got here we've got look number 34 which again I'm a fan of just classic Glenn Martins in terms of the approach. It looks like it could be, it looks like whatever material is printed on there, but I'm sure it's just regular, you know, sweatshirt material made to look a little bit like denim. Um, I like these long boot socks things going on with the logo. I'm a big fan of the nice little purse. I'm a big fan of as also the bracelet. Um, that's pretty cool. And the same glasses the other model was wearing. Um, as you can see there, like right, that material probably looks like something else but i'm sure it's just regular sweatshirt material but that was pretty cool uh let's move over from that one and what's this look number 51 out of 57 another favorite of mine as you can tell why you've got these nice denim um you know double knee type of combat type of material going on there you've got a nice leathery looking um what do you call that I don't know what that look is called. I remember getting those pants. I think Rick has got those type of pants as well. They kind of look a little bit like oil spill. Um, so it's really shiny black uh, shirt you got there on top of or underneath a basically long short jacket thing that looks pretty cool as well. And obviously the hoodie on top I'm a big fan of. So all those things are looking pretty decent, pretty fly. And you've got this look here towards the end. Look at number 56 where the model's wearing this amazing down jacket. That looks really, really cool and kind of reminds you a lot of the crochet type stuff you saw Jacquees wear recently. I think it might be Bottega Veneta. It's kind of all we do like that. Um, that kind of reminds me a little bit of that. So, so with the kind of down jacket with the little squares on it. Um, I do like the skirt. It looks like it could be roses or it looks like it could be flipping pictures of explosions or kind of, you know, um, what, what they call nuclear bombs going off all over the place. I like the fact that they've kind of, you know, um, oiled up her feet. I feel like with black models, whenever they come to these sort of shoes, they leave the feet incredibly dry. It looks really horrible. And then you've got this nice bag also. It looks pretty clean. Um, this bag might end up being very popular. I'm even a fan of the shape itself and the way that the models kind of tied it on here, make it look like a Birkin with a handkerchief on there and the jewels, of course, I'm a big fan of. So yeah, really, really good collection overall. I can't be mad at this, but like I said, I wonder if um if this sort of like pre-collection if turning your pre-collection into a a diffusion brand is going to be a lot of things that people are going to be interested in going forward i'm not really too sure because i think he mentions it here in the review in it there somewhere let me see i think it's in this bit where is oh where did i put the review is it there it is so he mentions it here in the review courtesy of Vogue runway courtesy of luke leach um i think he says here where is it um because diesel is not a luxury brand um, and this is important to remember this means that our pre-collections unlike say Louis Vuitton or Balenciaga is speaking pre to the same customer as the main one are for a different audience than our shows although there is some overlap our shows are for more people in the fashion industry while with our pre-collection we try to speak to everyone my brother my mother teenagers in high school everyone so it's a very different exercise for me which again pretty cool way to approach um a diffusion line quasi because i guess not people don't really say diffusion line nowadays i wonder if because they don't want the customers to get an idea that this is anything less than the main brand and they want to have it occupy the same sort of level i'm not really too sure or if it's just a way to kind of get out of um naming it something like that i'm not really too sure when it comes to those kind of things but i do like it's an overall appeal and what it's about so definitely big up diesel and get martin's doing 
but I am curious to know if there will come a time where people will become bored of this aesthetic and it will come very because again it's only seven collections in at the moment and I'm kind of getting a little bit bored of it and if we saw Alessandro Michele getting the boot at D&G or sorry Gucci I imagine maybe if this keeps continuing, would there be competitions around Glenn Martin's being taken out? I don't think so because I don't think anyone was talking about Diesel prior to Glenn Martin's getting there and doing what he's doing. And I'm sure the sales numbers have reflected that because even I've seen myself when I've been going out, even some gig I played that recently, a DJ that came after me was very hipster and very kind of cool. He was holding one of those kind of um, Dolce and Gabbana sort of, um, sorry, um, Diesel side bag things with the logo on it i'm sure most of you know what i'm talking about but if i'm not mistaken let's say it's a diesel bag it's a really famous one and he was using that as his dj bag so if i'm seeing hipster guys using that i can imagine the general consumer's probably got a real punch of yes i think it was one of these bags this one it's called the diesel uh bijou bijou bag right is that what it's called bijou no it's not uh, no it's diesel sorry my bad did you shoulder bag is it called a name what's the name of it yeah it's called a shoulder bag i think a bijou is um is meant to be a, a what you call it bijou is like jewelry in it i think it's in french jewelry or something like that bijou bijou or is that or is that sweet I'm not too sure one or the other but anyway it's a shoulder bag thing i saw a dj wearing and um, carrying all their dj stuff in there in terms of headphones and usb stuff so um clearly it's kind of got some sort of cachet with the people in the know so they probably might end up keeping it alive. But it's interesting the distinction that he made between this and the main line. So let's see what happens going forward with this. But um, I wonder if it's going to end up becoming tied sooner rather than later. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Then I want to quickly touch upon this. Philip flipping Plin. Because I don't get this stuff. I really don't. I don't understand how he constantly gets coverage on Vogue Runway. I wonder if it's all paid in terms of reviews. Because none of this stuff really... I would say would connect with or relate to people that read Vogue or are into fashion in any kind of way, shape or form. I don't think many of them are going to Vogue runway to check out what Philip Plin is doing. So I'm interested to know how he consistently has his stuff up on Vogue runway. And it's also funny for me because I feel to I feel like, you know, put Yeezy or put Kanye's or Ye's politics to one side. If people had such a hard time accepting Yeezy as fashion because it was all streetwear and hoodies and whatnot, or even what Demna was doing at Balenciaga earlier on, or maybe Betamar earlier on, I don't see how you can, you know, scrutinize one person for doing that, but then have nothing to say about Philip Plim essentially putting out all this dumpster fire worthy level of content and clothing out there that doesn't necessarily speak to anyone that reads his website. Because to me, this is just as bad as like a Mike and Miri type brand. But I guess Mike and Miri, what he's got going for him is that actual cool people like rappers and musicians and, you know, other people in culture like to wear his brand for some reason. Maybe because it's like an American, you know, Hedy, um, Hedy Semaine or something. I'm not really too sure. But regardless, um, it's just as bad as this. Like, just as bad. Everything from the baseball jackets to the parkers to the jumpers what is this like embroidery bandanary type printing that he has going on here it just legitimately looks like the stuff that you'd imagine the son or the daughter of a billionaire would be wearing day to day thinking they're doing something but this stuff is absolutely garbaggio legitimately garbaggio it's horrendous absolutely nothing nothing good in it whatsoever this could all be lit on fire tomorrow and no one be none the wiser it doesn't help that one of the models here looks like ddg so you've got that lack of cool you got some Diet Kendall here wearing the stuff and you got some kid who looks like the villain in every sort of high school Netflix romance thing going on as well. But all of it looks terrible. Look at that bag. Look at that bag, man. It looks like it's like a bandana print. Again, he's doing bandana prints in 2023 or 2022 to 2023 going forward, right? And it's got, it's like a bandana print orange type thing going on so maybe it's like you know maybe they're hoovers i'm not really too sure and then you've got plin written there on the side in black in this kind of quasi gothic um tattoo type font the boots here look pretty decent these green boots look not too bad they're these kind of green cowboy boots that go up towards your knee with a sort of really thick wedge type sole even at cardigan i'm not too you know what this whole look i'm not too mad at to be honest but the rest of it is garbage. Like, look at that. Look at those same boots in that look, with the jacket and the leggings. Absolutely shocking. But here, I think it looks pretty decent. But look at that. This 
fucking DD, just as like DDG look, like absolutely rancid, really rancid. I'm not sure sure how he gets on Vogue Runway all the time, but somehow he managed to do so. Let's see what the look at the review. Three paragraphs of fucking Philip Plin. Big up Luke Leach for doing God's work. What do you got to say about his collection? Speeding legally up the Autostrada from Milan to Lugano in a Mercedes G stuffed with uh, Panettone, what? Panettone and samples, Philip Plin checked in hands free to update on pre four. Almost immediately we delivered. Ground covered included what? Almost immediately we that we diverted. Ground covered included family life, new store openings in Qatar, of course he's opening a store in Qatar, of course. A new store in Frankfurt Airport, of course. Brazil last week and ten further locations these for Plin Sport in the months ahead. So he must be raking in mid who's I'd love to see the actual consumer who buys Philip Plin. Like un unironically. I'd love to see them. I'd love to. Um I wonder if it's like kind of like those type those kind of rich types in like Munich and Dortmund. Um I'm sure there's a few in Zurich that probably wear them. Maybe some places in France, not really too sure. Maybe Marseille, who knows? Overall, Flynn said the company is seeing its greatest growth in wholesale while online is keeping level with 2021's pandemic prompted gains. Um, next year, we'll also see major pushes in South America and new opening in New York on Spring Street. The Plin show previously planned for New York in February will instead happen in September. Huh. We get to we get to pre-4. So evidently, this is um was a Paisley heavy year. That's a print. Paisley. In 2023, people. Imagine. Um, following the summer's um, heavy uh, petal Hawaii inspired florals. So you got Hawaii shirts last season and then you've got fucking Paisley this season. You you know, he gives it he gives it to you all, man. He really kind of, you know, spoils his customers. It's a common trend. You see it in fashion brands all the time, like Dior and of course Etero, always married to it. Obviously you cannot reinvent it, but we did it in our own way. Yeah, you definitely did it in your own way. In a fucking garbage way. Look at this fucking shit, man. Holy shit. Um da 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 uh beaded on um outwear, embroidered on ripped denim, studded onto bags and leather garments and printed onto silk, sometimes full looks, plus sneakers it was as Plin said, the theme of the show. Uh, theme of the season, the most explicit Flynn flication came on basketball vests, which whose teardrop seeding decorations were planted to create a pattern of his house skull. You know what's very interesting in these reviews? Unless it's somebody that they don't like. They do a good job of just reviewing the show without ever giving you any idea on what they actually think. So I have no idea what Luke actually thinks of this show. All I know is him describing his interaction and conversation with Philip Lynn, but I don't have any idea on what he actually thinks of the show. Was it bad? Was it good? Is it something that he would wear? Is it something that he thinks customers will be into? Nothing. It's just like a very vague and surface level review that does nothing to really explain anything. Um, anyway, third paragraph. Elsewhere, there was an emphasis on the sartorial menswear and classically impactful women's evening wear, often presented above a metal-toed, inset heel-shaped shoe design. <laughs> People are dancing and partying again, he said. So this is a response for those we are hearing. They want to party in. You know, right now, I'm thinking like a retailer. Pre-collections are typically 65% of the business or more. What the fuck? Is that true? People buy 65% of pre-collections. No, sorry. Pre-collections account for 65% of the overall business. That is insane. When you think, to me personally, I think of any brand out there, usually their pre-collection is the worst, in my opinion. The main collection is usually where it's at. The pre is usually like a distillation or, you know, it feels like cutting room floor type, you know, cutting room floor type level stuff left over that you want to just put out as a show, whatever it may be. Or stuff that you're thinking on that you're not really too sure you want to put in the main show. But 65% of the overall business is wild. Um, we want to overperform again next year. It's exciting. We cut the core as we went into a tunnel. Eyes fixed ahead. So this man's in his G-Wagon. Probably a Paisley covered one also. With gold rims. And he gives him a lowdown on his collection. And Luke Leach finds no way of kind of actually critically, critically critiquing the show. That's why fashion reviews are dead, isn't it? You don't hear anything from him this way. But dare it be a black designer or somebody from streetwear coming in and doing fashion, you start seeing these fucking cunts get on their fucking high horse and start pontificating about fashion with a capital F. It's not tailoring. It doesn't belong on a runway. This is not fashion. La, 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 la. 
But then Philip Plain can get away with all this garbage, garbage clothes, season in, season out, legitimately, legitimately polluting the earth. There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of turtles at, in the sea right now choking on these stupid, ripped denim, paisley, nonsense type things that he's put out there. We want to hear a squeak, a peek from these fucking fashion types. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely horrendous. Look at this. Absolute garbage. Absolute garbage. Inundated with garbage. All of it. Set it on fire. Set it all on fire. But yeah, big up Philip Pin, I guess, in some regards. But hey, you gotta get it how you get it, I guess. You gotta get it how you bloody get it. Next and as we end here, I went to quickly end on this story. Very interesting, very funny. It looks like Mr. Daniel Lee's redemption in fashion has been completed. Everything that has gone on beforehand has been forgotten about. The rumors of him calling some woman in some Bottega Veneta boardroom a black beepity beep 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 have completely gone. No one cares and he's been resurrected and now become the creative director of Burberry after Ricardo Tishi got the boot for somehow, you know, falling so low that he gets a boot from Burberry. Imagine somebody of Ricardo Tishi's talent getting the boot from Burberry is really showing you how low that guy is. He's down real bad. He needs to stand up immediately. I'm not too sure if there's ever going to be a renaissance of flipping Ricardo Tishi. Maybe it's just, you know, one of those things that happens in a designer's lifetime where you just lose it. I'm not really too sure how that can happen because I still remember very fondly the impact some of those early Givenchy Ricardo shows had on me, especially when it comes to the casting and the physicality and the textures and the aggression and the attitude behind the clothes. And then it comes to Burberry and it's like, and of course, Burberry, you know, they have to keep it moving. They decided to go and hire Daniel Lee of former Bottega Veneta fame to try and resurrect the brand or to bring it back to some level of relevancy because it's been dying and struggling for a while. But as I said prior, Daniel Lee has been at the heart of controversy himself because he got booted out of Bottega Veneta allegedly because of some very racy racial remarks. He said, especially think about it, this was like post all that George Floyd thing happening post all these brands putting up black squares and saying that they're going to, you know, try and do things differently and try and get more minority marginalized voices involved in what they do and not have it be so whitewashed. And, you know, they're going to try and rewrite the wrongs of having one rule for others and one rule for us. But really at the heart of it, this is what happens. If you, this is what happens. If you're on, if you're on recorded camera saying you love Hitler, you're out. But, if there's rumors that you might like Hitler, you're not out. Because if you if you if you listen to the rumors out there, Kanye's been saying these things about Hitler from time. But no one really was willing to come out and say anything about it because at the time Kanye was doing his thing, everyone was basically clout chasing off of him and kind of sucking all his coolness and his value to the culture out of him. Then as soon as he became, you know, um, uh, as soon as he be, didn't become useful to be associated with him because of all the anti-Semitic rhetoric he was putting out there and going on that flipping anti-Jew press run and whatnot, then people started to back away and then suddenly all the stories about, oh yeah, when he was making My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, he actually had a song that about how much he likes Mussolini. Oh, now you suddenly got a voice you want to speak. Same thing goes for Daniel Lee. So he might have said these things about black people in meetings, which is funny because for the longest time, it felt like he was kind of pandering to us blacks out there. He might say these derogatory things about people behind the scenes, but because it wasn't on camera, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It wasn't on camera. We can't say nothing that wasn't on camera. And he gets a job immediately. I don't have a problem with him getting a job. I said, I'm, I'm anti-cancel culture. I feel like cancel culture should only be applied to the fans. I don't feel like corporations or industries should cancel people i feel like it should always be the fan so if the fans are brands or the fans of fashion overall says you know what we don't fuck with daniel lee we're not going to support anything that he does and they decide to protest and refuse to buy burberry because of what they heard fair enough but i don't want the industry to come in and say you're cancelled for stepping out of line you're cancelled for saying wrong speak you're cancelled for not having the right opinion no it should always be the fans but 
I also don't like the double standards. I also don't like the selective politicking. For instance, I feel like if this was anybody else, they would have probably been excommunicated from fashion. But because he's got a value, because of all the great work he did at Bottega Veneta, which, you know, you can be argued about in terms of what his impact was because of what Matteo Blasi is now doing at Bottega Veneta. Was he really the talented guy behind it? I'm not really too sure. But regardless, he's got some rep behind him. So clearly brands are going to be willing to take a chance, especially people like Burberry. But, the double standards I hate because it. I want to be fair for everybody, even playing ground. If I fuck up and say something very derogatory, which I would never, but just imagine if I said something insanely crazy about the queer, flinter, LGBTQ community, I want to be given the same grace that he gets given. I know it's not going to happen because it's similar to sports. If Messi does something compared to a fucking random player in the Man United squad, of course he's going to get more leeway because he's fucking Lionel Messi, but let's not pretend like that's not happening that's what people are doing they're pretending it's not happening and again Vogue giving this big spread interview is really really insulting but anyway let's read it regardless courtesy of Vogue checks new mate Daniel Lee shares his vision for Burberry written by Nicole Phelps it says Daniel Lee is sitting in a penthouse suite at Claridge's in an army green sweater sporting black pants and Nikes of course he is Call people niggas in boardrooms and you get to sit in carriages sipping on green tea and enjoying life. Of course. It is mid-November and beyond his French doors, uh, behind him, a sweeping view of the dizzying London is visible. Big Ben stands in the distance. The night before, Lee was at the Chiltern Firehouse. Of course he was. Call people niggas in boardrooms and you get given a fully comped room in the Chiltern Firehouse to pontificate over fashion and pretend like you're sorry for saying the things that you said when you're not really because you still get paid. Of course. Anyway, reconnecting with local fashion reporters and at least one of his former professors of Central St. Martins, of course he went to the same uni I went to because it's full of absolute toppers. Of course. And his throat is a bit sore. Hmm, wonder why. It was nice to do it in the kind of environment he says, you know, when I'm not exhausted from a collection. Get out of here. Lee, who's 36, was named Chief Creative Officer of Burberry in September, just days after Ricardo Tichy's final show, the British Heritage brand. It's a homecoming for the designer. His creative direction position at Bottega Veneta had him living between Milan and London. I am really happy because it feels full circle. I wonder if this first show at Burberry is going to have Skepta come out, the first model. <laughs> <laughs> right, Skepta Roll. Who's the guy? Who's the guy that's married to who's no boyfriend of India? Uh Dami. Right? He has Dami come out as a first model to kind of, you know, um counteract these rumors that he might be a racist. No, 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 no. Like look, I know Skepta. Look, look, it's Octavian. Look, it's Octavian. Skepta, look, look, look. <laughs> or one of those laughy laughy JD Sports commentator guys. I'm not sure what their names are. But those guys, all those comedy shows. Maybe you have one of those come out. I haven't lived here full time since my St. Martin days. I went to New York for Donna Karen, then Paris for Celine, then Milan, going back towards uh going going forwards between those various places and coming to London as an escape or for inspiration. It's nice to be back here and based properly. So imagine you get when you say racist stuff about the blacks, you get relegated to living in London after living in all these amazing places, New York, Paris, and Milan. I'd imagine, especially as a fashion person, they're probably, you know, they're way more fun places to live in in London day-to-day, -day, I'd imagine. But what do I know? And so that, 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 that might be his, um, his penitence, right? That he has to live in London. Um, when he's not working, which let's face it, isn't often these days. <laughs> when are they going to mention the racism? When? Let's see if they're going to mention it. Lee spends um, time with his partner, Ricardo Boule, a former principal dancer at the American Ballet Theatre. Let's see what his boyfriend looks like. Ricardo Boule, a dancer. So he's probably going to be, what, six foot plus, ripped like an absolute Adonis. Oh, look at that. Is that what is that what flipping um Daniel Lee's messing with, yeah? Skin. That's a very handsome man. No homo. This guy looks very good. Holy smokes. Look at this picture here. Look at this picture here. I don't even know how you get in that position. That looks like um I'm not sure if you guys have done workout stretches before, but when you're doing a something called a couch stretch, you kind of put your back foot on the back of a couch and you kind of have this type of position. But legit, I've never got myself in this kind of what is it like a like an eight position in my life? That looks incredible. Look at that. Look at the muscles bulging out all the places. Jesus Christ! Is that a book? Okay, there's a book by him there. Jesus, he looks incredible. 
So maybe is it going to be ballet influence? It's going to be like urban ballet, right? Like in the slums of London where we get down with a check print, right? It's going to have all these kind of... No, maybe it's going to be that. I'm not too sure. But yeah, regardless. Okay, cool. Mate, life life is good, isn't it? Life is good when you're Daniel Lee and you've got that at home. Life is absolutely swell. A foreign principal, blah, blah, they go to the Royal Opera House to see ballet. Um, Crystal Petey's Light of Passage was really amazing, he says. And they seek out music. Kendrick Lamar, the O2. Of course, I'm not racist. I like Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> um, he's also in the midst of a house renovation it's a georgian terrace very typical london which i love because it feels like a charles dickinson um it's nice to have that feeling of being in a space that is history and you're just a certain uh, just a certain part of it it's lived before you and it will live after you so it's got a new house everything's going well lee's burberry debut is scheduled for february 20th giving him just a few months to define the vision of the brand and uh, but take he had much more runway eight months from his appointment in 2018 for the first show it was his inaugural creator director role and at the start he was so shy to take questions backstage but didn't mean lee hacked sorry lee lacked a strong point of view his pouch and cassette bags were instant hits and the surprising appeal of his square toe woven in passetio shoes spawned copycats up and down london's high street ditto his sturdy puddle boots true which are still going strong now right um, these could be jumping off point for the more outdoorsy Burberry under Leeds watch but take a signature bright green came the hottest color in fashion the only thing I hate about fashion is that I think again I don't necessarily think he designed these things obviously so you don't create direction so maybe he kind of has final say on particular hardware pieces or finishes and whatnot but in terms of designing them there's obviously a accessories designer footwear designer that puts these things together and kind of you know ideates the initial concept but they're never celebrated so we never find out so for instance i kind of attribute the success of the famous um you know saint laurent um harness boot with heidi Semen, right but i'm sure he didn't actually design it himself i'm sure it was something that was done by somebody in-house but because they don't celebrate who the footwear designer is, you just attribute all the success to Heidi Semen. You think, oh yeah, he's a fucking genius. And I'm pretty sure, same goes to Bottega Veneta. The puddle boot, um, the tractor, the kind of, the, the other boot, the massive one, the kind of big brown one that everyone wears, or the black one, whatever it may be called, that probably isn't his. All the bags probably isn't him either. So, you know, like, who who are these people that are responsible for these things? Why aren't they celebrated more in fashion? Why can't we name them and say, especially when you're doing award ceremonies, like, oh, you know, footwear of the year, this person gets celebrated for designing this amazing shoe. Even like the Triple S, for instance, at Blenshaga. We know Demna did design that from scratch or somebody in-house that did it, but still, that person doesn't get celebrated. That's a really annoying part of fashion because it's definitely a collaboration and a collective effort, especially on that kind of level. You know, doing things all on your own you're not some you know st martin student anymore you're having to kind of produce stuff at that kind of level and produce it and manufacture it and get into stores you're going to need help so not celebrating those people is really really awful i'm sure people in the business know who they are because these designers of accessories and footwear and whatnot and bags they kind of you know um go they kind of uh jump from brand to brand to brand especially the big ones because everyone knows their power and how good they've done and the cv they've got and whatnot but it'd be nice for people like myself fans on the outside to also know their names so you can also celebrate them and stand them just as much as we stand the creative directors and lead designers and we concluded he was rewarded for all of this with four statues at the London uh, statuettes at London Fashion Awards in December 2019. Um, a feat matched by Nova designer before or after. Early on in the pandemic, Patek Veneta was flying high enough to step away from the show calendar in favor of more intimate runway um, off the circuit. Then, as quickly as Patek Veneta took off days after the Detroit runway show in 2021, Mary J. Blige and Lil Kim were in the front row. Lee left the house. The parent company's caring said oh, that only that it was a joint decision. Okay, they're going to talk about racism. Let's see let's see here which led to a lot of speculation both online and within the industry about why lee may have gone not gone he was let go definitely fired because we know how fashion is like if you've got a good thing going on why would you stop it why would you end it just to kind of hire his subordinate who's obviously doing a good job but still daniel lee's the kind of sexy you know glitzy name in industry maybe not so in the industry because you, you, you heard a lot of stories post him leaving Bottega Veneta that he was a bit of a tyrant and no one liked him and they all they preferred Bottega Blesi instead but still for us laymen out on the outside the kind of the star of the show was Daniel Lee so to sack him considering the success of the brand it seemed a little bit 
hasty and then when you think of the rumors it made sense especially when you consider the time in the year or time of the you know the time in life we're in with all the kind of you know strained racial relations in the states and whatnot and the conversations around um you know inequality in the workplace and lack of representation it makes sense why caring were like no we need to distance ourselves from this guy as soon as possible because we don't want anyone finding out that he's been dropping n-bombs in meetings all the time because he thinks he listens to kendrick lamar gives him a license to do so i'm not really sure but let's continue um when asked about all this um yeah let's see this when asked all of this no, sorry when asked all of this a year later lee doesn't address the matter head on you see instead he says i think people will see forward how the team continues to work together at burberry there's people i've worked with at various points of my career so basically he's saying that you'll see the black people who are hired at Patega Manetta will also follow me at burberry so clearly i can't be racist right i can't be racist it's impossible i listen to kendrick lamar and i've got black people working in my team he doesn't dwell on regrets either. I still feel very honored that I see the influence of Bottega Vanessa all around me, you know, when I'm walking down the street. Oh, look at that flex. He's feeling himself. Um, since Lee's appointment at Burberry, um, much has been made about the Britishness, especially since Britain, especially within Britain. Lee says he understands why. As a kid growing up, Burberry is a brand that everybody in the country knows. It's really a symbol of Britain and also the NF and all that stuff but anyway we put that to one side his own connection with the label is deeper than that of your average Englishman I'm from Bradford Yorkshire very close to Castleford which the trench coats are manufactured and to King and to Keeley where the Garbadine is made Lee says so it's very close to my homeland and some of my mum's family worked in various factories that were supplying for Burberry my mum actually has a trench coat that her aunt had gotten her as a retirement gift it's kind of sweet Lee is the oldest of three siblings and his brother a plumber and sister a nurse specializing in alcohol dependency both still live in Yorkshire not far from his mother and father we've been researching that what is left of the industry in the UK and the designer says sadly it wasn't as well ring fenced as it was in France or Italy but there's still elements there this is exciting to think about what's possible um, part about what possible partners we have and how we can help save jobs so clearly there's a rebrand effort going on there for me when it comes to burberry it's sort of similar to like reebok no amount of reinvention will ever make reebok or burberry cool in my opinion or will ever um disassociate reebok and burberry from their very english roots and if you know what i mean you know what i mean right nf type stuff and whatnot bmp type of vibes because from where i'm from especially in east london a lot of people that I saw wearing Burberry, I saw wearing Reebok, were definitely the type of people who, you know, they'd call black people monkeys and whatnot, and they'd refer to Pakistani people as Pakis. Definitely not things that you'd want to kind of uh, be uh, affectionately known as. So, if, the, if they're trying to make Burberry into a thing, it's going to take a lot of work. I don't feel like Daniel Lee is going to be able to do it. And if they want to try and make Reebok into a thing, post BMP and NF type of vibe, it's not going to work either. It just is what it is. Um, after settling in Lee's first order business has been getting to know the teams he's also been making trips to Florence where the company has leather goods and shoes facilities to Castleford for the trenches and to the archive which is split between London and Blythe in north of England I've been looking at the beginning of the three major codes of the house which is obviously the check the knight and the garbadine and trying to understand um, what them what can be inspired to make them forward what is the garbadine I'm not sure what's that word maybe something that I know but I don't actually know what the word of it is what is garbadine Garbadine is a durable twill, um, worsted let wool, a tightly woven fabric, originally waterproof and used to make suits, overcoats, trousers and uniforms. Okay, cool. That's what the trench is made out of then. The Burberry, the Garbadine. That's what the trench type vibe is made. Okay, fair play. The Browns founded 166 years ago when the young Thomas Burberry started producing garments, a ward of the British weather. He's credited with inventing Garbadine, a tightly woven waterproof wool circa 1879 functionality is a concept that lee has latched onto it's really about designs with meaning this um that's innovative with a purpose and as opposed to just being innovative for the new silhouette of a new constructional technique thomas Burberry's intention was to make clothes for people that were outside doing things he goes it's more than mentality that i'm trying to get myself into as the conversation returns to actual fashion lee leans in and says think about the trench coat it's been around for decades so what is the bag that can be stand so what is the bag that can stand the test of time like the trench coat? What is a shoe? What is the overcoat that lives legitimately next to the trench coat and will be around for a very long time? We're thinking about the feeling of the outdoors. It is not necessarily about the overcoat, but also about warmth, tacidity, coziness, 
and about being on the move and not being weighed down. I'm quite excited about starting with the winter show because I think this makes a lot of sense with Burberry. That's true. Very, very true. Let's see what happens anyway, isn't it? The guy's clearly talented, knows what he's doing, apart from my jokes and whatnot. What he said there is quite exciting and how he's kind of approaching it. So let's see what he does. Lee is something of an outdoorsman himself during the year. Between Bottega Veneta, he travelled to Botswana and Zambia. In Barbway. Ah, I like Kendrick Lamar. I travel to Botswana and Zimbabwe. Yeah, I can't be racist, mate. It's impossible. Botswana especially was incredible because it's one of the least inhabited countries on the planet. Um, it grounds um, you in a way to be around animals. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. You also hiked Machu Picchu and went to Cuba twice. <laughs> I can't be racist, mate. Look at my team. Look at where I go on holiday. We won't have to wait until the runway show to get our first clue of the direction of Lee's uh, headline um, heading. Last month, he shot his first run with Burberry campaign with Tyron Le Bon, a London-based photographer with whom he collaborated on Protective Veneta. It features Burberry classic scene throughout Lee's lens and is set to launch in early February on the usual channels. It's more traditional media strategy than one implemented at Burb and Bottega Veneta, which famously deleted the Instagram content. Then he takes his favor of a more digital journal. I love working with Tyrone and his team because we all contribute to all the ideas. We have a real relationship and it's really about London and the UK, the mix of people who are the best at what they do. You know people with real substance. He prefers not to name names yet, but confirms that there will be a cultural of dance, football and music. Oh, we're going to see Skepta. We're going to see Saka. I can't think. Let me think of the blackest people that you can use though. Skepta, Saka, and who else? Someone else is very black. I don't know. Whoever else you can think of out there in dance, he's going to get them on their front and center. <laughs> and we're all going to lap it up, mate. Lap it up. Burberry flies um, the flag for Britishness in the UK. Hmm, more so Englishness, but hey, let's continue. So we have to use our platform. Um, because we have a responsibility to communicate those things. I don't know if this is the right way to, to say it. Uh, but more than surprising people, I really would like them to see the new vision, feel reassured and like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. This is what Burberry should be. I'm not racist. I didn't say that, but yeah, you know. <laughs> the first fashion show Lee saw after graduating from St. Martin's was Christopher Bailey's fall 2012 collection artist for Burberry. The one with the artificial rain, the knitwear was really great. Christopher was there. Da, da, da. Will Lee stay long? He seems to be approaching it as a bit like a Georgian terrace. I don't try to predict too far into the future, but you know, my intention is to write an iconic chapter. Well, considering he's refurbishing an entire house there and whatnot, I'm assuming he's probably planning on staying a while. I'm sure that contract is probably five to six years or something like that. And if he does a good job anyway, because of how much Burberry's struggling, I'm sure they'll end up keeping him there anyway going forward because they've not exactly been doing great stuff. Um, when it comes to their collections in any way, shape or form, because I can't think of anything that's been great at Burberry, um, especially in recent years. It's been all pretty, pretty shocking. So he doesn't really have much competition in terms of um, being able to put out a semi-decent collection. I'm just going to take a quick look at the kind of the overall um, snapshot of their latest collections, but I don't think I've seen anything good from Burberry in many, many, many years. So he probably doesn't have much work cut out for him. If he put something somewhat, you know, somewhat interesting on the runway. People will absolutely lap it up. So let's see here if I can see anything that's going to be somewhat interesting. Go to Bear Brace, click it there, and see what the vibe is saying. But I can't think of anything that was. Oh man, I knew they would do that. Let's go here. Let's put do Bear Brace. I can't think of anything that was super, super good here. But let's think of it. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Boom, boom, boom. Whoops. It didn't find it. Of course it didn't find it. Because it didn't find it. Of course it didn't find it. Let's go do it one more time and see if it works here. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. It's loading. The runway slowest site in the world. Let's just type in Burberry here. Now it should load up, shouldn't it? There we go, Burberry. Click here and take a snapshot look at all the collections and see what I want. Yeah, see, even the Ricardo Tishi ones are tearing out. Everything's so bad. Look, so much cream, isn't it? That kind of cream house coat thing is everywhere. If anything, that's the one thing you probably should do first collection. Fuck it, just come in all black. Look at them. All the collections are brown, cream, trench coat, colorway, everywhere. So horrid. The same things all over the gaff. But they have a lot of money to spend, all the resources in the world, but it's never really been cool in any way, shape or form. 
And again, even Ricardo Tishi sunk there. Everyone sinks there. I think if if they go, even if they get a job to Raf Simmons, he'd sink. It just seemed, this brand seemed like it's doomed, man. Absolutely doomed. Look at this stuff. Garbage, 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 garbage. So he's got his work cut out for him, but considering how stellar that first Protect of Veneta collection was, um, that still lives in my memory rent free. That first collection on the runway was banging. I still remember one of my favorite jackets from that collection was that kind of um, floor mat type jacket thing that was the zip sort of like came around on the side. It was really impractical and weird looking, but definitely one of my favorites from there but yeah big up Burberry hopefully it works out for him with Daniel Lee over there I'm sure he's got the support of the fucking fashion industry anyway because he seems to be the media darling or whatnot so that should be good and for him going forward but anyway that's been the Zing Show episode number 633 thanks again for tuning in and being patient with me I do appreciate it um, if it's the first time checking out the show you know what to do like, subscribe comment, share all that good stuff would be very much appreciated more information regarding myself you know what to do click the link in the description actionzinger.com www.exynozinga.com for more information regarding myself, contact links, social links, previous work, DJ gigs, DJ live streams, podcasts, all that stuff is on there, and my photography stuff, everything you can see on there, actionzinga.com. If you listen to the audio podcast, you'll hear my tune today coming up. But if you're watching this via the YouTube video only, you'll just fade to black. But if you're listening via the audio podcast, you'll hear my tune today. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care, be safe. Peace.